This interview is made possible by the generosity of the Terry Lee Wells Foundation. My name is Patty Bernard, and I am a member of the Nevada Women's History Project, which is a statewide organization that researches and publicizes information about Nevada women. The Nevada Women's History Project played a most important role in securing Nevada's second allocated statue in the National Statuary Hall Collection in the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. NWHP not only proposed the idea of Native American Sarah Winnemucca as the second statue, but also supported the proposal throughout the state legislative process and was also responsible for the funding of not only that statue, but also funded a replica residing in our state capital in Carson City, as well as a smaller statue in Las Vegas. Our conversation is with Kathy Nonneman, former NWHP Northern Nevada Chairwoman and NWHP member Kathleen Clements, who planned and oversaw the statue dedication events, which was held in Washington, D.C., March 9, 2005. Today is Friday, January 18, 2019, and we are meeting with Kathleen Clements and Kathy Nonneman. One of the tasks that the Nevada Women's History Project had to undertake was to educate the legislature and the general public as to why we wanted a statue of a Paiute woman uh, in Statuary Hall. And Sarah Winnemucca um, was an author, a scout, a teacher, um, a leader of her people who championed them with speeches all over the country with uh, a trip to Congress to when uh, the Paiute tribe was uh, had been taken uh, from from their native Nevada and she was very instrumental uh, and was um, a tribal leader and um, a woman who um, was a representation of her uh, of her tribe and of uh, of Nevada women. So, but people didn't know that at the time. So one of our jobs was to to teach people how uh, how and why we chose Sarah, and that's where Sally and Johnny and Georgia Hedrick really played a part because Sally's book was very, very popular and people got to know Sarah from Sally's book and from Georgia Hedrick's campaign to have an elementary school named after Sarah. Once we had the proposal, we had to make sure that we could get the resolution through the legislature. And that fell to Assemblywoman Marcia de Braga, who um, spearheaded that for us. Um, the legislature uh, passed the bill and uh, gave uh, permission for uh, the, stat the second statue for the state of Nevada to be Sarah Winnemucca. However, they said, we will give you no money. So you have to go out and raise all the money to pay for this. Well, thanks to um, the uh, powers that be uh, in our cities and towns from Winnemucca to Las Vegas to Reno uh, and private citizens uh, raising money and making contributions, we ended up raising well over $200,000 to pay for this project. We formed a committee with Mary Ann Convis and Carrie Townley Porter, two of our uh, members, and they were on the statue selection committee. And with the help of Governor and Mrs. Gwynn, um, a contest was held and they chose a man named, a young man named Benjamin Victor to create the statue of Sarah Winnemucca. Uh, while the money was being raised, 
uh, Benjamin began to work on the statue. Uh, he did some of that work at the library and archives, State Library and Archives in Carson City, which was open to the public. And that was part of our education process so that the citizenry could learn all about Sarah and support her, um, her statue. And hundreds and thousands of people came uh, in those few months. And uh, Benjamin <laughs> generously would stop uh, his sculpting and explain to um, people from all over Nevada, including many members of the Paiute tribe themselves, all about the history of Sarah and, and what she had done and, and her contributions to the state of Nevada. Um, when that was finished, um, we then had to look to Washington, D.C. and approach our congressional delegation so that they could arrange for a statue dedication ceremony. At that point, I needed somebody who could take charge of that process because it was highly technical and involved a lot of um, close coordination with Washington, D.C. I knew that we had a member uh, who was a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, uh, an expert on logistics, and a person that I knew to be very detail-oriented and a person who could accomplish miracles. And at that point, with <laughs> looking at how how is this going to be finished? How are we going to make this happen? I turned to my friend and fellow board member of the Nevada Women's History Project North, uh, Kathleen Clemens. And Kathleen, I'll with that, I'll turn this over to you as I did in, two I think it was 2005. 2004. Uh, 2004. May, 2004. And when I... Uh, begged and pleaded that she would <laughs> give so generously of her time and talents. Kathy? Well, well, Kathy, you should tell the rest of the story when I accepted the position of what my caveat was in accepting the position. <laughs> well, I informed Kathleen that I would form a committee so that she would not have to do this alone and that she would have help. And Kathleen said, all right, but you have to be the only other committee member, Kathy, and you have to promise to get out of my way and leave me alone and not offer any suggestions, and I will come to you when I need something from you. Otherwise, I'll just keep you updated. And I said, You've got it, girl. <laughs> it's all yours. So, yeah. Um, I always like to call myself chair of something, but really I work alone. It's my style. I find it easier that I only have to talk to myself. Um, as Kathy said, uh, I was familiar with, number one, with the Washington, D.C. area because I had just moved to Nevada in uh, 1995 from... Um, right outside Washington, D.C. And so I was only 10 years removed, and I also, at that time, had been working in the travel industry, and so I was familiar with contracting with hotels, and I had put lots of conferences together over the years. So my first thought was, well, we have to have a date for the statue dedication. And so I looked at what was going to be the best time frame. And we thought March is going to be the best, number one, because it's uh, Women's History Month. And so that would be appropriate. You also have to have it when Congress is in session. Congress must be in session when you have the dedication. And so when were they going to be in session? When were they not going to be out for Easter break or whatever various breaks that they have? So I came up with the date of March 9th, 2005, 
and wrote a letter to the Speaker of the House, who is responsible for the all the dedications in the rotunda of the United States Capitol. Was and that said, Dennis Hastert? Uh, J. Dennis Hastert was the Speaker of the House at the time. Of course, he's no longer there. Um, in fact, the only person who was there on the dais at the time was Nancy Pelosi, who is still now the Speaker of the House um, from 2005. Um, so I wrote a letter to the Speaker of the House of um, J. Dennis Hassert and said, um, I'm kind of in charge of this little project and we want to have a dedication in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol on March 9, 2005 and then started to work everything around that date. Uh, the next thing I did was start to work with the people in the congressional delegations. Um, our main contact was a gentleman, Corey Kennedy, who was a legislative assistant to, at that time, Congressman Jim Gibbons from the second, uh, second District in Nevada. And I also worked with Neil Cornsey, who was an um, assistant to Senator Harry Reid, uh, Joanne Jensen, who was an assistant to Congresswoman Shelley Berkeley, who was representing the 3rd District at the time. Um, did not work with Congressman John Porter. No, I guess Shelley Berkeley was probably the 1st District. I apologize on that. I think John Porter was the 3rd District at the time, and I did not have to work with his office at all. I just kept them informed. And I think the one thing I did come back to Nevada Women's History Project on is that, okay, we're going to have this dedication. It's going to be a one-hour ceremony. What can we do to enhance the dedication to make it worthwhile for people from Nevada to fly all the way to Washington, D.C.? And so kind of started looking around at what's normally been done with other dedications. And typically other states, when they've had a dedication, have a reception in the rotunda immediately following the ceremony. Well, number one, that's really difficult to do because you can't close off the rotunda. They limit you in the time, the amount of people you can have. So we started looking at other locales to have some sort of a reception following the um, the ceremony and that ended up to be the Welcome Nevada section uh, excuse me Welcome Nevada reception that was held at in the historic offices of the United States Public Printer which at that time was Bruce R. James from the state of Nevada and so that kind of started coming together then so now that's two events that you can go to, but that's still a long way to go for Washington, D.C., to go to a dedication for an hour, go to a reception for an hour. So maybe we should come up with some other ideas, and maybe we should have a Nevada Women's History Project conference in Washington, D.C., and turn this event into a three-day program uh, to really make it worthwhile for people to go. And I would go back to Kathy, I would go to different people and say, what do you think about this? And I go, that's a good idea. And I go, okay, well, let's run with it. So that's how the, there were dedication events that turned into on March 9th as part of the Nevada Women's History Project Conference, Washington, D.C., Congresswoman Shelley Berkeley, uh, inter, or, um, opened, uh, welcomed us to the United States Capitol and um, set up uh, tours for people. And I think we had about 80 people attend that and we had, I don't know, eight or 10 staffers because there was groups of 10 that went around through the Capitol. Then Mrs. Gwynn, because I did everything with Mrs. Gwynn's approval on the project, I met with her on a regular basis and would come to her and give her my proposals and she would say yay or nay. She was very actively involved in the project. And she wanted to have some sort of a luncheon or a pre-reception, which turned out to be what was called the State of Nevada reception. That was not open to all people. It was open to the congressional uh, delegation, um, a few invited guests, in doing the State of Nevada reception for Dima Gwynn, um, who was the First Lady of Nevada at the time, 
Um, I set that up on basically her behalf. Nevada Women's History Project did pay for that, not the state. And I should go back and say, why was I representing the state of Nevada at the time? And that was because the uh, way that Assembly Bill 267 was written, uh, the, 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 at that time it was the Department of Museums, Library, and um, Culture. Cultural think, Affairs. Cultural Affairs. It turned into the Department of Cultural Affairs during that same legislative session. And um, they basically said that they had nobody within the department that could handle this responsibility while doing their own job. And so with the concurrence of uh, Sarah Jones, who was the person that would have been uh, responsible in, within the state, the responsibility for the project was turned over to me. So I represented the state and Nevada Women's History Project in everything that I did. Um, and that's how I ended up uh, reporting, for lack of a better term, directly to, uh, again, First Lady Dee McGuinn. Um, er she was kept apprised of everything because this had been one of her projects that was very near and dear to her heart. Um, she was very instrumental throughout the entire process of Sarah Winnemucca from that original proposal in 2001 up through the dedication and opening up the governor's mansion for the pink teas as fundraisers. She sat on the statue selection committee. She was just, this was really one of her very, very pet projects. And so she was involved in all aspects of it and I reported to her. Um, once we kind of started coming up with the events for the actual state functions, which was the state of Nevada reception, the dedication, and then what became the welcome Nevada reception after the dedication at the historic officers, um, historic offices of the United States public printer. Then I started filling in with the Nevada Women's History Project, Washington DC conference. And that was three days of events, uh, again, starting out the morning of March 9th with VIP tours of the U.S. Capitol that uh, Congresswoman Shelley Berkeley gave an introduction to. And then uh, she had all the tour guides there to break into small groups. Um, then we had the State of Nevada reception. That was kind of a private by invitation only event. It was held in a room that right now I can't remember exactly which room it was, but it was in the Senate side. Uh, very elegant room. The, the thing that I remember most about that is that when Senator Reed had brought his maquette, he had bought one of the small maquettes from Benjamin Victor and he had brought it to the state of Nevada reception and he had it on a table and everybody was ooing and eyeing over it. And then he and his delegation, walked, they were the last people to walk out besides me to go down to the dedication and he left his maquette on the table. And I carried that maquette around all afternoon and it was really heavy. So the little maquette sat with me on a column in the rotunda of the Capitol when I was trying to, I just needed to set it down because it was so heavy to carry. And uh, I'll never forget that. And I finally was able to get it over to his office in between uh, the actual statue dedication and the um, uh, reception that night. Uh, the third uh, function on March 9th was the Welcome Nevada reception. That was uh, done in coordination between, again, Congresswoman Shelley Berkeley's office and uh, Mr. Bruce James, the, uh, I believe he was the 17th public printer of the United States at the time. And it, that was a wonderful, and I was over at the offices that morning going over some last minute details in between some function, and, and it was a working office. And then when I went back at six o'clock that night for the reception, it was party central. It was just, it was amazing. It was just amazing. Tell us about how the statue itself got there. Oh. And there's a, a, a kind of a story, story. a backstory about <laughs> what happened with the statue before the dedication. Oh, that was. So I flew into Washington, D.C. several days early to, uh, to get things organized, to, uh, it was a crazy time. 
And Benjamin Victor had gotten there the day before, and the only other person who was there that day was uh, Bob Harmon, who was at that time the public information officer for the Department of Cultural Affairs. And he was there to make sure that there was news coverage uh, for everything. And so the they arrived, I don't remember which day, and the next day the statue arrived from the foundry by a commercial trucking company, and they had to take it up the steps. And what's the foundry in? Colorado or Kansas? I think that, Colorado, Colorado, I think then, yes. Colorado. And uh, as it was going up the steps, Benjamin noticed that the little... I call it a little stem that comes out of the flower that Sarah is holding in her st hand. Like a stamen. Like a stamen. Was not there. It had gotten broken in shipment, evidently. And Benjamin is beside himself. That's the day that I flew in. I got there that evening. Benjamin gets in touch with me in the hotel, and I go to see him, and he is... I can't, I cannot put this statue. We just have to take it back to the foundry and fix it. And it's like, no, we really can't do that. We have this whole ceremony set up for the two days later, I guess it was. And is how are we going to fix this? So we immediately, I got in touch with um, the, the Corey Kennedy, who I was working with in Congressman Gibbons' office, and he put his head together with some of the other staffers, and they said, there's, a, I'm going to say it was like an Ace Hardware. It was right on Capitol Hill, and they would rent us the equipment that Benjamin could use to fix it. But no kidding, it took an act of Congress to allow these materials to be brought in to do the repair. So the next day, so whichever day it was that I get there, the next day I meet Benjamin, we go to Congressman Gibbons' office, we get start, they send us to where we can rent the equipment. Now we're in a taxi cab because we have all this equipment that we have to carry. Was it like a welder? Oh or? yeah, we had we had all kinds of stuff. I I can't remember all of it, but it was heavy and it was a lot. We took it back. We had to get it through security. That was part of the act of Congress that it took to get this stuff through security. We stored it in Congressman Gibbons' office. Then I think Benjamin and I went to lunch because then we had to wait until like 4 or 4.30 when they start closing down the Capitol before Benjamin could do the repairs. So, and all this again has to be approved. You, you just can't walk into the rotunda with a welder, you know, they just don't allow it. So we get there at like 4 or 4.30, but there's still tour groups leaving the Capitol. And Benjamin's overworking, and I'm sitting with this young staffer on a bench. And the tour groups would see Benjamin working on the statue. So once again, they would go over to him, and he would stop working and explain what he was doing. <laughs> I said, this isn't going to work, because we also had a time frame. You know, we had some place that we needed to be that evening. And so I finally, every time I saw somebody walk through, I would just get up and I would walk over and I would stop the people and say, I'm really sorry, this is the, this is the artist, his statue's gonna be dedicated tomorrow, but we need to allow him to work. And, and they all went through and they were all appreciative of knowing what was happening. And pretty soon, it's probably now pushing five o'clock, probably about the time they're gonna kick us out. And this young staffer and I were sitting on this bench and I'm going, this is pretty cool. I'm in the rotunda of the United States Capitol, just Benjamin, the staffer and me, and I'm looking up and thinking about our government and our country and it was just amazing until Benjamin walked over with this huge smile on his face. And anybody who knows Benjamin Victor knows it when he smiles, it just lights up his whole face. And he goes, she's done. <laughs> and it was, it was just, that to me was probably the best part of doing this whole project. It was just such a special event. And we finished it. We got back to the hotel, changed our clothes because we had a function, a private function to go to that evening. <laughs> it was quite a rush, but we did it. 
So that was really special. That was really special. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember a story about how uh, Benjamin had Benjamin had brought his family. Yes. And um, you, he, you got him a babysitter. I got him a babysitter. <laughs> Because they didn't want to bring their two children at the time were very young and they didn't want to bring them to all the functions that dad needed to do. So I got him a babysitter because <laughs> I still knew a lot of people back in the D.C. area and they fixed me up. But my very, very dear friends fixed me up with a babysitter. And that was great. Yeah. But we also went to the National Women's Memorial. Yes. And had a day there. So after so. Um, on, on March 9th, like I say, we had the first function of the three-day conference. So if you signed up for the Nevada Women's History Conference, included in your conference um, agenda was the VIP tours of the U.S. Capitol uh, in the morning of March 9th, the actual dedication, and the uh, Welcome Nevada reception at the public printers. Then the next day, we spent all day at the Women in Military Service for America Memorial. Um, I had worked um, here in Nevada on um, letting people know about the memorial. I was at the dedication. I was at the 10-year reunion. Um, so I was very familiar with that, having served in the United States Air Force for 20 years. Um, and that turned out to be a great day. We had um, General Vaught, who was the founder of the Women's Memorial, uh, as our guest speaker for a lunch that I was able to arrange a caterer. And we had lunch right in the museum. We had uh, the Nevada Women's History Project donated money for the flange of the Nevada State flag that's in their Hall of Honor. Um, and that was incorporated into the event, uh, and, the and dedication. I think on the bottom, it mm -hmm. says uh, Nevada Women's History Nevada Project. Women's History Project yes. that, that we had donated that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was it. Was that was really a lovely day? Um, then the fall, and if if you didn't want to go. Uh, because we had men and women who attended the Nevada Women's History Project, if you didn't want to attend the function at the, at the Women's Memorial, which was sort of our business meeting, was incorporated in our state business meeting, um, my husband, who had formerly worked for the National Air and Space Museum as an archivist before we moved out here, he arranged uh, private tours at the National Air and Space Museum, the new Udvarhazy uh, Center out at Dulles mm -hmm. Airport. So he had, I forgot, about 20 people went and did that, and we had bus transportation for and, them, and, and they had And, and your lunches. husband is Vaughn? Vaughn, my husband's Vaughn, Vaughn yeah. He's, Vaughn Clements. He's a good guy. He put up with me through all of this. <laughs> um, then that night, we had a dinner at the Old Ebbett Grill in a very famous restaurant, big power broker's restaurant in Washington, D.C., and we had, oh, we had well over 100 people at that. That was a fun dinner. Dinner, just a get-together dinner. We didn't have a program or anything. Then the last day of the conference, uh, we had a, a private tours with the tour mobile company that took us around, and we went to Arlington, and we went down the National Mall, and we stopped at different places. Uh, we then went to the new Museum of the American Indian. I, believe is the, the correct name, yeah. um, and saw what they had on Sarah Winnemucca, and they had a very lovely display set up. Then um, we go to the National Archives, too. And then the, the, the last function was at the National Archives, and they had pulled the records that they have on the National Archives on Sarah Winnemucca, and one of the... Um, I've forgotten her exact title right off the top of my head, gave the talk, mm -hmm. and she was very worried. She called me up when I was in D.C., and she goes, you know, there's been some things written about Sarah that wasn't so nice. And we said, we already know. It's in <laughs> Sally Sanjani's book. <laughs> so, so you can discuss them. She goes, oh, good, because I didn't know I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> so, and, oh, and I do want to go back about um, uh, Sarah and the actual dedication events. One of the things I did when I was setting up the events is I did brief the Intertribal Council of Nevada to gain Native American support for the statue. Didn't go quite as well as I would have liked it. 
and never did, even though they approved supporting the project, they never did anything. I couldn't get them to do anything. But very fortunately, Chairman Melendez of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony and Ben Alec of uh, the Paiute tribe, Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe um, worked the issue for me. And because of that, Mr. Ralph Burns from the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe gave a native blessing in the in the Paiute language at the um, during the dedication. Again, that almost took an act of Congress to get approved. Uh, they, the only other um, dedication prior to Sarah, I believe, was Sacagawea, and they. Anyway, I, I won't go into it, but there is a lot of stuff that they didn't want to happen, but they did approve the blessing, and it was wonderful. It was very appropriate, um, uh, and I was so glad that Mr. Burns did it. He also did it at the statue dedication at, at Carson City as well. Right, um, and uh, you were also in charge of uh, the two other dedications that we had, the one in Carson City and the no. one in Las Vegas, right? No, not Carson City. Oh, okay. The Department of Cultural Affairs did the one in Carson City, and I did the one in Las Vegas for the half-size statue that was donated to the city of Las Vegas, and we followed the same format. Oh, I should talk a little bit about maybe the format. Even though it, when you read the official documentation, it reads that the United States Congress um, accepts the statue of Sarah Winnemucca for the National Statuary Hall collection from the people of Nevada, something to that effect. But the people of Nevada have no control over the ceremony. <laughs> the Speaker of the House is in total control of the ceremony, and you are only allowed two speakers from your own uh, state. Now, we were very, and it might only be one, I'd have to go back and double check on that. We were very fortunate because Senator Reed at that time was the uh, minor, or majority leader in the Senate, and so he automatically got a spot. <laughs> um, so it's all like the Speaker of the House gets to talk, the President Pro Tem gets to talk, the majority leader, the minority leader, um, it's all very, it's all very scripted, but we were lucky and I was able to then get Governor Gwynn as one of the speakers uh, on the dais and that does not often happen. And also, um, having spoken to mm -hmm. uh, Benjamin Victor, who now has two other statues mm -hmm. in Statuary Hall, mm -hmm. one from Nebraska and one from Iowa, mm -hmm. Um, he he has told us that we are we were very very fortunate mm -hmm. in having as much input into uh, uh, the ceremony uh, <laughs> as we did we because did. that does not often <laughs> happen and I think most of that is <laughs> thanks to you. And um, Benjamin has also told us that there are very few invitations now yes. sent for people to go. But you were in charge of those invitations, mm -hmm. and tell us a little <laughs> bit about that. Well, one of the things that I've always known is everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time. So people in positions of supposed power don't bother me at all. <laughs> I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. And so, yes, I was able to accomplish a few things that maybe somebody else, and, and one of the things was, this is kind of a backstory that not everybody knows. I'm sure the gentleman's retired now. If not, he needs to be retired. We had to have a meeting. Who even knew that the United States House of Representatives has its own drapery department? <laughs> And we, Benjamin and I had to go and meet with the drapery department people concerning the drape that was going to cover the Sarah Winnemucca statue to typically pull off. You would typically have a drape and you would pull it from the top. And we went to meet with the drapery department people and to say, would it be possible to design a drape that's tied at the top and it would fall down 
because we were afraid if we tried to pull a drape off, it could get caught in Sarah's fringe on her dress because, of course, the Sarah Winnemucca statue, it looks like Sarah is in motion and her dress flares out and there's some fringe on it. So we go in and there was this gentleman who, like, he was some representative between the architect of the Capitol who is where you go to get the statue approved and the House of Representatives. I don't really know what his whole thing was. And he just comes up and he gets in Benjamin's face and starts telling Benjamin everything he did wrong with the statue and how this is the worst thing in the world that somebody could fall down and hit their head on the fringe. And I just got, and I am like, you have got to be kidding me that this guy is being so rude the day before this is going to go in. And, and who are you? So I just got in between this guy and Benjamin, and I just started giving the guy the wet for. And I said, listen, this isn't your call. It's already been approved. We're just here to get, make a drape for it. And anybody could fall down in Statuary Hall and hit their head on a base of any statue that's in there and do as much damage. So get over it, guy, and go away. Oh, oh he was just all, who in the hell? heck is she? <laughs> and then in the meantime, so I gave him my wet for, and then I turned my back on him and started talking to the um, individuals from the drapery department who were going to make the drape. And they were so excited that they were going to be able to make something <laughs> that was different, <laughs> that was going to fall down. And they made this lovely drape. And then during the actual dedication, it started to fall down and it got caught. <laughs> and so then, then Benjamin, Governor, I think it was Governor it was Gwynn. Governor, Governor, Governor Kenny, Kenny Gwynn. Kenny Gwynn yes. Yes. Governor Kenny Gwynn, I think then called Benjamin, which was a big no-no. That was <laughs> that was a big no-no <laughs> onto the stage to, to get it uncaught from the, the fringe. That was like so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and the other part that was interesting about that, and I was sorry to see politics in the whole thing. Senator Reed, Harry Reed, wanted to do something really wonderful for the people of Nevada. And he wanted to put a camera in the rotunda right next to the C-SPAN camera. C-SPAN being that they cover all the, the House and the Senate side, what's going on in government. And they beam it out, but C-SPAN, not everybody has access to C-SPAN unless you're on cable or satellite or something. So what Senator Reed wanted to do is to have a camera that he would supply, he would supply the cameraman, next to the C-SPAN camera, and he would feed that broadcast to all of the TV stations in Nevada so they could live broadcast the dedication. We were so excited about it, and I was on my way to Senator Reed's office, I think. I spent a lot of time in the halls of Congress, um, both sides. Um, and I ran into his assistant, and she was just... She was beside herself. She goes, the Speaker of the House is not going to allow it because at that time, Jay Dennis Hassert was a Republican and Senator Reed, the camera that he would have borrowed would have said DNC on the side. And so Speaker Hassert would have nothing to do and denied the people in Nevada a live broadcast of the dedication. And I just thought that was really petty. <laughs> And but, not everybody knows that story either. <laughs> but there is a recording, isn't there? There is a recording from C-SPAN. Right. Yes. And, and so you could purchase that if you did have C-SPAN and some sort of a, gosh, back in the day, I think you had to do it on a DVD or a, a video recorder, I think, if you wanted to try and record it off your TV. But you could purchase a DVD of it from C-SPAN. But you had to purchase it. It wasn't for free. And... Um, about the invitations, how oh. many invitations did we get, and who who designed them? Um, each state, or when the statue dedication is done, you are, I believe, it was two hundred and fifty invitations, is all that the state of Nevada was allowed. 
um, I should look that up, but I believe it was 250. Each person had to have their own invitation. So I could not send an invitation to Mr. and Mrs. John Smith. It had to go to Mr. John Smith and Mrs. Mary Smith. And you, so what happened was on that is that I had to get kind of a pre-invitation list out to everybody and say, we would like you to attend, can you attend, or are you planning to attend? And if they said no, boom, their name was off the list. And because I had to keep it to, I believe it was 250 people. And, and I believe we if, filled and did all the 200. the state require that certain people be yes. uh, invited? Yes. And yes. then as they declined, you yes. could <laughs> fit, fill in yes. with some of our members. I filled in with the members. I filled in with, for instance, there was a young, I believe she was a Girl Scout. Her name was Molly Laddie. Um, I think she might have been from Fallon, and uh -huh. she was she wrote a letter in support of the Sarah Winnemucca statue. Mm, right. And we were able to get um, invitations for she and her family. Um, we got invitations at the very last minute for Mr. and Mrs. Peabody from um, uh, Massachusetts when Sarah Winnemucca had stayed with the Peabody sisters when she was on her speaking engagements. Um, and they were, the Peabody sisters were the proponents of the first kindergartens. And we found descendants of the family and were able to invite them. Uh, it was, we had a, a, just an amazing mix of people there all about Sarah. But you had to have your own personal invitation. If you did not have it when you walked up to the door, you did not get in. And that included everybody who was in attendance, other than the, for the congressional people. <laughs> right. So we had members of uh, the Nevada government. Yes. I remember yes. that our state yes. treasurer was there, Kathy Augustine mm -hmm. at the time. and uh, um, I remember Guy Rocha was there. State uh, the archivist. archivist. Uh, of course, Sarah Jones was there. Her boss, Scott Sisko, was there. I don't recall, I do have the entire list. I do know everybody who attended. Um, and I'm not sure we actually ended up with 240, but we had well over 200 uh, people there. Uh, Sally Sanjani was right. there and her husband was there. Um, and many of our members were many, there. Many, uh, uh, well, over, um, well over 40, well over 40 of our members probably pushing 50 or 60 of the members, and then many of them brought spouses. From talking to Benjamin Victor, I understand that we were so fortunate to be able to have so many of our Nevada population involved in this whole project, from raising money to um, uh, the Girl Scouts and their project and, and writing uh, in support of the statue, uh, people giving donations of ten dollars here and five dollars there, and everybody was so excited to be able to be involved in uh, in this project. Uh, it, it's it's been our as the Nevada Women's History Project uh, our greatest accomplishment because the statue that we have now in Carson City. Uh, in the old Capitol building, people come from all over the, the country and all over the world to see that statue. And the one in Washington, D.C. is no longer uh, just in the Capitol Rotunda. It's now in the visitor center so that everyone coming in to see our nation's capital sees statue sees our statue of Sarah because at the time uh, before Benjamin created her most of the statues were men, of men and they were very stiff and uh, marble uh, and in the style of previous times Benjamin uh, started his career with this statue and she moves. Mm -hmm. She 
is not someone who's standing there very stationary. Uh, there's there's movement. There's um, a representation of, uh, of of planes and and of our um, our geography in uh, in the way way she's dressed and the way she moves, and and that was the beginning. Uh, now, since then, uh, other states have said we want more modern statues, and of course, Benjamin has benefited very much from that. He's now a very famous mm -hmm. sculptor who has. Um, a permanent studio at Boise State University uh, in Boise, Idaho. And we can take great pride as, a, uh, as an organization in that we had uh, a part in creating this statue and letting people know uh, more about our Native American culture in Nevada. Well, I think for me, having done the project, mm -hmm. I'm very proud of the work that I did. I am very glad that I did it for the state and representing Nevada Women's History Project. It was an amazing three days. It was just an amazing three days. And then we followed it up with a book, It Can Be Done, that again, one of our own members wrote, Mona Reno, about the entire statue project. And I think that that's a worthwhile read. It's got uh, all of the bills and the monies and the process that we had to go through. It's got lots of pictures in the books that we took. And mm -hmm. it was just a great time. And for me, uh, having made a lifelong friend, with Benjamin Victor and some of the other staffers that I worked with. It was just amazing. They were young kids when I worked with them because I was all in my, well, it was 13 years ago, so I was in my 50s when I did the project. And the, and the young staffers I worked with are young. They've gone on to amazing careers in their own right. And as uh, you said, uh, Sarah's in the Capitol Visitor Center. So you don't even have to go inside the Capitol. You can just go in the Visitor Center and have lunch and admire Sarah. That's what my husband and I did one of the last times we were in Washington, D.C. And it, she was a fascinating woman. She deserves to have the statue. And I was proud to be a part of the project. And this book, It Can Be Done, mm -hmm. um, Tell me a little bit about that. It, isn't it in the uh, Library of Congress? Yes, because it is required by the state to be done to accompany and state the history of what the statue is all about. It took us a few years to do it because there was, again, a little bit who's going to do it, some people in the state or Nevada Women's History Project. Nevada Women's History Project once again stepped up to the plate and um, and the book is it's wonderful and it was paid for by, by the, the Nevada Women's, Women's History, History Project, Project. <laughs> and uh, written by one mm -hmm. of our members Ro yeah. Mona Reno mm -hmm. it can be done is the name of the book mm -hmm. and uh, the Nevada Women's History Project takes great pride in our having done it because our mission is to uh, write about and, and educate people on the contribution of Nevada women. And, um, and this certainly, uh, I think, is our finest hour. As Sarah Winnemucca herself said, it can be done. And it continues to be done. Nevada Women's History Project for all of the years since its inception has been working on biographies and oral histories of women. We continue to do that to this day and they're posted on our website. Thank you, Kathleen.